Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Even though I was already introduced, I feel I should introduce myself to you. Hi, I'm Leah. Uh, here's a fun fact you might not know about me. I'm originally from Greece, and specifically from the island of Lesbos, which technically makes me geographically lesbian, probably one of the very few you'll ever meet. In other news, I like making stuff. You might have used some of my work. Most all of it is on GitHub. I'm an invited expert in the CSS working group. My day job is doing HCI research at MIT. HCI is just a fancy term for usability. And I've written a book. Uh, people like it on Amazon. And actually, there's a, it's one of the prizes for the competition afterwards. So go to the competition, and you might win one of them. So CSS variables, not to be confused with SAS or less variables, completely different things. So the first ever CSS variable we probably got was current color. It came from SVG, and by now it's supported everywhere. The way it worked is it always resolves to the value of color. So if I change the color property here, the, color, the, the current color and the gradient changes as well. However, even though this is great, this was great before we got native CSS variables and we could hack a lot of things with current color, as you can imagine, it's very, very limited. So CSS variables are kind of an, an, ex an expansion of this concept. It's like current color on steroids. CSS variables are basically custom properties that start with a double dash, like this. And we, use, we refer to them like this. And we can use them everywhere. So basically, I can replicate the functionality of current color like that. Before I move on, um, I'm sure you might be thinking, this is a terrible syntax. A double dash? That is disgusting. Why not just use the dollar or the at sign, like less and sass? <laughs> so there are two reasons for this. The first is that we want people to be able to use less and sass variables and CSS variables. As you'll see in this talk, CSS variables do a lot of things you cannot do with less and sass variables. So the, the idea is you keep using your preprocessor of choice for the things you can do with preprocessor variables, and you use CSS variables for the things you cannot do with SAS. So because the syntax is different, you can use the dollar variables of SAS, and you can use the dash dash variables of CSS, and they both work together just great. You could even have a, a dollar blue SAS variable and set, it, a set, a set, and set a CSS variable with it, and it would just work. So you might be thinking, OK, I understand that the syntax had to be different, but why does it have to be so ugly? So the other reason is we wanted something that is compatible with existing CSS parsers. And CSS properties can only contain letters and dashes. So we needed something that A can be parsed by existing parsers, and B will not clash with any properties we define in the future. And that's where the double dash comes from. Essentially, it, the, the inspiration for it was the, the prefix properties, like dash webkit dash. It's basically an, a prefix property with an empty prefix. <laughs> True story. So after this little parenthesis, you might be thinking, OK, you replicated current color with CSS variables, but I, could, I can do that with current color and have wider browser support. So why are CSS variables useful? Why should I care? Let's define another property, corners. And we can go here and say 100% minus whatever value corners has. And now I have made another custom property that controls the size of these corners that I can use anywhere. And you might be thinking, OK, in this, in this case, you could just write 20 pixels right there, uh, or 1M, or whatever. But you haven't really gained anything, right? However, when I say anywhere, I mean anywhere. I can take this corners declaration and put it in an inline style, and it still works. And since I can put it in an inline style, I could also set this with JavaScript. And actually, the last section of this talk is exactly about this, all the cool things we can do when we combine CSS variables with JavaScript. Because that's the biggest difference of CSS variables and SAS variables. CSS variables are live. They can be updated at any point, either by a pseudo class or JavaScript or inline styles, anything. 
So beyond the syntax of the double dash to define the variable and the var function to call it, there's also another thing, which is the fallback value. Uh, let's say deep pink here. And let's give this black or whatever. Um, and this fallback is applied when the variable is not set, which is also useful. And we'll see some caveats later on this talk. So the first takeaway is that CSS variables work exactly like normal CSS properties. In fact, the spec for it, for them, is not called CSS variable, variables. It's called CSS custom properties for cascading variables. Yeah, it's kind of a long title. So here is a simple uh, HTML structure, just six divs, uh, three parent divs and three child divs. And here, and I'm using, I'm setting, um, a dash dash outline variable on the first one, just this outer div, the white one. And I'm also saying that everywhere that the outline variable is set, set the outline property to that. So you might have noticed that even though the inner div doesn't have any dash dash outline set, it still gets an outline. And the reason is that CSS variables are inherited properties which is useful in many cases. For example, you can set them on the HTML element and access them from any element. But in, in some cases, you might not want this behavior. For that, you can use the universal selector and set them to initial. And because inheritance always has lower precedence than uh, explicitly referencing the element, even with the zero specificity of the star selector, then if you haven't set the outline va variable explicitly on the element, then it will just be initial, which means no value, which means this declaration is not applied. So the second takeaway is that CSS variables are inherited properties, but you can change that. So you get the, you get the best of both worlds. There is a default, but you can change it. So you might be thinking, ah, I can think of a cool use case for variables. I have this image folder, and I have these complicated backgrounds, and maybe I can use variables to set my background image. So you might try something like this for your first attempt. And then you might think, hmm, how do I concatenate a variable with a string? Maybe I should try the, the same thing I do with the content property, which is placing the strings next to each other. So you try something like this. And you're disappointed to find it doesn't really work. So at this point, we're like, OK, let's, let's explore this. Maybe we should try something else. Maybe we should put the entire URL here and just put bar inside the URL here. And maybe that will work. Nope. That doesn't work either. So at this point, we're kind of desperate. And we're like, OK, I'm going to put the entire URL in here. That, that must work, right? It, this must work. Nope. Why is this? So these are three different issues with three different reasons. The first one that we tried is a CSS limitation. We currently cannot concatenate strings. The, uh, the content property is an exception. It's defined that in the content property, you can put strings next to each other, and they're concatenated. It's not a CSS-wide thing. We will probably eventually get some syntax to do this, but right now we don't have any. The second one that we tried is a CSS bug. The URL function is very peculiar. It has very weird parsing rules, one of which is that if you see a closing parenthesis, uh, then the whole thing is terminated. So it does not really understand variables. It was written before variables. And it's an exception. You can use variables in any other CSS function. We've seen them in the beginning in radial gradient, but not in the URL function. This will also be solved eventually, but right now you can't. And the last one is a Chrome bug. I'm using Chrome for this presentation, and it has a bug. So, and the, the actual bug is, uh, is not that it doesn't understand URLs in variables, it's that it doesn't understand relative URLs in variables. So if I go here and copy my URL and put it here, it works if I make it absolute. Go figure. Well, actually, the, I can explain this issue in a bit more detail. Uh, so the reason that Chrome has this bug, and it works in Firefox, but not in some edge cases, is that it's actually underspecified how browsers should resolve 
relative URLs in variables. And you might be thinking, well, what is there to resolve? It's pretty obvious what should happen. Yes, if all your CSS is in one file, it's pretty obvious what should happen. But what happens if you have your variable declarations all over the place? If you have one CSS with some variables, another CSS that calls these variables, and a third CSS that calls variables from the second one? So do these variables resolve relative to, to A, B, or C? And actually, this is, this is debated in the CSS working group right now. So if you go to that GitHub issue, if you have an opinion on this, uh, because basically what should happen based on the current definition of CSS is that variables resolve based on the place where you call them, which is C. But some people have said maybe this is not very useful. So if you have an opinion, please come and tell us. Keep in mind that most people in the CSS working group are not actually web developers, so they have no idea what web developers actually want. So <laughs> input is very useful. So right now, until these issues are solved, CSS variables plus URL equals chocolate ice cream. <laughs> Some more WTFs, because this is CSS after all. An empty value is invalid. Dot, uh, dash dash foo colon semicolon is invalid. You, that's not a WTF. That's pretty expected. What might not be expected is that, is that this is valid, and the value of foo is a, is a space character. Also, lowercase foo is different than uppercase foo. CSS variables are case sensitive, unlike any other CSS property. Eh. So I mentioned fallbacks earlier which is the second parameter to the var function. And you might be thinking, wait a second, CSS is cascading style sheets after all. Isn't the cascade supposed to provide a fallback? Like, can't I just specify a declaration before the one with the var, and that's my fallback? Not quite. So the, the fallback is applied not when, not when the browser doesn't understand variables, but when the browser understands variables, but they are not set. So, as you might imagine, if the browser doesn't understand variables at all, the var function is invalid, so the second declaration is ignored, and the first one is in effect. So, if there's no CSS variable supports, uh, the entire background will be red. However, if the browser does support CSS variables, but accent color is not set anywhere, or it's set to its initial value explicitly, like dash dash accent color initial, then we get orange. And of course, if we set accent color to a specific color, we get that one, otherwise variables would be pretty useless. So if accent color is yellow green, we get yellow green. So here's the thing. What if we set accent color, but we set it not to a color, but to something nonsensical for the background property? What if we set it to, I don't know, 42 degrees, which is completely useless in backgrounds, what happens then? How many think it's going to be red? Raise your hands. How many think it's going to be red? Nobody. Correct. How many think it's going to be orange? A few shy hands there? That's a good guess, but it's not correct. The actual color we will get is transparent, which may seem completely crazy, but hear me there, there's a reason. And the reason is we cannot get, of course, we cannot get red. By the time we've gone to the second declaration, the browser has already thrown away the first one. We, we can't get red. We can't get orange because accent color is actually set. We have a value for it. What happens is that the second declaration becomes what we say invalid at computed value time. And this means we, we have thrown away all other declarations by then. We cannot use them. We cannot fall back to red. We cannot fall back to orange. What do we do? We go to our initial value, which for background is transparent. For uh, the color property would be black. For, um, you know, for border would be none. Every property has an initial value. We jump back to that. So, fourth takeaway, invalid at computed value time is a new concept that we defined when we defined variables, and it means initial. It's exactly the same as the keyword initial. 
So, oh, um, and these fallbacks is something we can also daisy chain. Uh, the fallback for color one can be color two, and the fallback for color two could be color three, and so on. Also, you might think, if, especially if you're coming from a, pro from a programming background, you might try to do something like this. Um, in the second div, the one that's inverted, maybe I want its size to be 1M bigger. So I do something like this, var size plus 1M. And I'm like, why doesn't this work? Instead of getting 9Ms, I got either something very small or no height. It's like no height has been set at all. What's happening here? So the thing is, CSS is declarative. There is no instruction order. For a given state and a given element, a, a, a property only has one value. You cannot have this is the value of the property before this instruction or after this instruction. There is no such thing. There is no such concept of instruction order. So actually, because, because every property uh, needs to have one value, it's not possible for it to be both its previous value and its value plus 1m. That's just nonsensical. So in case such cycles are detected, and this is a very trivial cycle, you might also have cycles like a refers to b and b refers to a, and so on. If such cycles are detected, it's exactly the same thing as if the variable was set to its initial value. And if the variable is set to its initial value, this is also set to its initial value because this, has, this doesn't have a fallback. And its initial value is auto. So it's exactly the same as if we haven't specified any height for that element. So fifth takeaway, cycles make, it, make variables invalid at computed value time. So here is a small trick question there. So let's see how many have been paying attention so far. So the last two lines are exactly what you've seen in the previous example when I explained fallbacks, background red, and then background uh, var accent color with a fallback of orange. And then we have two accent color declarations, one that sets it to a nonsensical value and one that sets it to itself. So how many think that the result is going to be red? Show of hands. Nobody? Correct. It's not going to be red. How many think it's going to be orange? One shy hand there, a second, a few hands. And you are correct. It is orange. Why, why, why did this happen? So remember before we said that if it's, for, if it's 42 degrees, we will get transparent because it's invalid at computed value time, and it goes back to initial, which is transparent. The thing is, right now, the value of accent color is itself, which means it computes to initial because it's a cycle. The first declaration is actually a red herring. It's completely ignored. It, 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 the second one overrides it, so it's as if it wasn't there. So the trick here is that the second declaration is exactly the same as if we said accent color initial. And because accent color is set to its initial value, we get the fallback, which is orange, because that's when the, that's when the fallback is applied. Of course, if the second declaration is not there, we get transparent, which I find kind of ironic. We get the fallback when we have an invalid declaration there, but when we don't have it, we get transparent. I think that was kind of interesting. So I know that at, some po at this point, many of you might be thinking, OK, all this is cool, but won't somebody please think of browser support? How many browsers really support CSS variables? Surely it's not many. It's probably just Chrome, right? I've heard this from so many people. Actually, it is not just Chrome. It's every single browser except Edge. And actually, you even though I know that you might be thinking, oh god, why are these Microsoft guys spoiling my life continuously? I hate them. I want to change from being a web developer and go raise farm animals because of Microsoft. Don't think that way. Microsoft has changed. They're actually quite nice now. They're trying to support standards. They actually support some standards that other browsers don't. And specifically about CSS variables, they have announced that 
It's in development, and it will be in the next version of Edge. So very, very soon, every single browser will support CSS variables. And of course, until then, we have a lot of tools at our disposal. We have the cascade, as usual, background red, background var, which we can always use to provide fallbacks. We have ad supports, which, as you can see here, is supported by every single browser, including Edge, since Edge 13. So if you want to apply some different CSS for browsers that support CSS variables and some different CSS for browsers that don't, you can use the ad supports rule. And any CSS variable and any value works there. So I just use dash dash CSS colon variables just to remind myself what this is about. And of course, you can also use the not keyword to apply some uh, CSS to browsers that do not support CSS variables. And of course, as you can see here, this is red now, because Chrome does support CSS variables, so it's ignoring the entire ad supports block. Another interesting thing about variables, and especially a, a difference that CSS variables have from SAS variables, so or less variables. Let's assume that every time I say SAS, I mean less as well. I'm not trying to like, show preferences there. So in this case, we have a div that is sized um, 33VH, uh, uh, sorry, 33VW horizontally, 33VH vertically, which basically means it has exactly the same aspect ratio as the viewport, and it's one third of the viewport. So we might, be, we might think, I don't like repeating this um, 33. Like, what if I want to set it to 30 and I have to do it twice? That's not very dry, right? So I want to set a variable that says size and I set it to 30. So then I go here, and I say var size v8, vw, and var size vh. And then I look at what I've done, and I'm like, what? Suddenly, nothing works anymore. So the reason this doesn't work is that variable values are basically token lists. The browser doesn't see this as a string that says 30 that it, we can just put next to vh, vw. It sees it as a, as a number, and then it sees VW as an identifier. So essentially, for the browser, it, base, it, it resolves exactly the same as this, which is an invalid value. So with width and height, they're invalid at computed value time. Actually, not even at computed value time. They're invalid values. And you just get their initial values, which is auto. So what can we do in this case? What we can do is it's a little more syntax, but we can use calc and multiply the number with 1VW. And of course, here, let me copy this. And here, we multiply with 1VH. Yes, it's a little more syntax than SAS. But that's what you get when you have live variables that have structure to them. It's not just all uh, spitting out strings. You might think, what if I try to save myself at least one calc? So what if I say 30 VW here? So I set the width to just var size. And then here, I go and divide it by 1 VW. And I see that this doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? I would expect it to work. 30 VW divided by 1 VW, it's like elementary school maths. The reason it doesn't work is that dividing by lengths is not supported in calc yet. And the reason it's not supported is that when we specified calc, the whole concept of something being invalid at computed value time did not exist yet. So we were like, but what if the the denominator ends up being 0. And then what do we do in that case? It's division by 0. And we couldn't make it invalid at computed value time because that concept didn't exist. So we can only divide by numbers. So take away, if you have a number in a variable, you can always convert it to any unit you want by just multiplying with 1 and that unit in calc. But if you have a unit, there is absolutely no way to convert it to a number. You just can't do this. Maybe you can do it with, of course, you can do it with JavaScript. You can do everything with JavaScript. But with CSS, there's just no way to do this. So 
Which brings us to our sixth takeaway. You should use variables for pure data, not CSS values. Only use variables for CSS values if it's something very quick that you've defined, like in this specific uh, rule, and you're just going to use it in there. But in most cases, just use it variables for pure data. You can do anything to pure data. If, if it's just numbers, you can always convert them to anything you want. If it's CSS values, like 10 pixels, you can't really do very much. So many, how many of you have used CSS animations or transitions? About half. The rest of you should definitely try them out. They're very cool. So those of you that have tried uh, using CSS transitions and animations might be thinking at this point, hmm, CSS variables are cool. You know what would be even cooler? CSS variables and animations. You might be a bit disappointed. <laughs> so here I have an animation, very simple animation, going from yellow to blue. And I'm thinking, what if, instead of animating background color, I say background color is the BG variable. And here, instead of setting background color, we set the BG variable. It should work, right? Conceptually, it should work. I'm animating this value, and background color is always set to this value, and this value is live. Why doesn't it work? So the reason it doesn't work is that even though variables are token streams and they're lightly parsed, the browser kind of pretends that it doesn't exactly know what type they are. So they're like, the browser's like, oh, I don't, I don't really know how to interpolate this. So nothing really happens. Actually, there's also a browser bug in play here. What should happen is that you should see yellow and blue uh, abruptly going from one to the other with no transition. You shouldn't be seeing transparent. That's, that's a bug. But you wouldn't be seeing a transition, sadly. So this is the, the actual quote from the spec from anybody who is into that. Uh, CSS variables can even be transitioned or animated, but since the UA has no way to interpret their contents, they always use the flips at 50% behavior that is used for any other pair of values that can't be intelligently interpolated. So this is also what is supposed to happen when you use display, for example, in your keyframes or any property that doesn't have a defined interpolation. Many browsers don't actually follow that, so it's kind of a mess right now. But yeah, at this point, CSS variables plus animations equals chocolate ice cream. Of course, um, oh, in the future, you'll be able to define what type your variables are by using JavaScript. <laughs> so you'll define a CSS property, a CSS variable in your CSS. You will animate it with a CSS animation. But to tell the browser how to animate it, you'll have to use JavaScript. OK, that makes sense. So one thing is, even though you cannot animate the variables themselves, you can use variables in keyframes. So if instead of having yellow and 0 CA, I wanted to have color 1 and color 2, and these could also be defined in um, the root element or whatever, because they inherit. So let me copy this. And I can go to my animation here. Now I've returned it to its original state. And now I'm going to use variables in it. As you can see, this works just fine. So using variable references in animation keyframes is fine. It's animating the actual variables that you can't do. Also, you, uh, here's, here's something that might baffle you at first. It did baffle me when I first discovered it. So here is a transition. When I'm clicking on the slide, notice the active pseudo class there. When I, I'm clicking on the slide, it turns blue because of the second pseudo class. And I'm using CSS transitions for that. But what if I said background var color? And then I set color here to yellow and color here to blue. As you can see, 
this actually does animate. So when I first came across this, I tweeted, so it turns out we can use CSS variables in transitions, but not animations. This is very weird. And I got a reply, I think by Tav Atkins, uh, that basically what's happening in this case is that it's not the variable that is, animate, that is transitioning. It's that the change of the variable is triggering a transition in background. So if I restrict my transition here, and I say only transition the, color, the dash dash color property, there's no transition anymore, because that's not the actual transition I'm seeing. If I change it to background color, now I get my transition back, because that's the property that is actually transitioning. So now that I've discussed the basic uh, syntax of variables, some common use cases, this is probably one of the most basic components that we all use. But what I say in this uh, slide pretty much extends to every component, including web components. But this is probably the simplest one ever. It's just a button. Um, it's a flat design button. So the, the border is the same color as the text. And then when I hover over it, the border color becomes the background color. And same here, and I have a pink variation whoops, with the pink class where I define different colors so that uh, when I hover over it and everything, it, every color that was black in the previous one is now pink. And as you can see, I had to basically define my colors three times on every variation. So how can CSS variables help with that? I can define a color variable and set the color property to that variable. And I can set it here as well, and here as well. And now, I can go here and just set the dash dash color variable and get rid of all this code. And it just works exactly the same way. Even more importantly, I don't need to have predefined variations anymore. I can ditch this all together, and I can go here and I can say this. And I, can, I, I now have infinite variations. And of course, I don't have to do it with an inline style. But say this is a more complicated component, and I've released it to the public, and people want to skin it. I don't need to provide predefined variations for them. They can just set a color property and set it to whatever color they want, which means both smaller CSS and more flexibility for people using the component. And also, it's not just about greater flexibility in smaller CSS. It's also about encapsulation. Encapsulation is a concept from software engineering, which means uh, basically that people using a component don't have to know how it works internally. And they can, they can use it. And its internal implementation can change. And they don't have to change their code. So notice how the background just abruptly changes when I hover. What if I wanted to use a transition? And I wanted to say, uh, instead of using a background on hover, I want to use a, bo a box shadow, an inset box shadow, with no blur and a spread of one. And inset has to be after the color. Right. So as you can see, and let's restrict this to box shadow. So as you can see, now I've changed how the, comp how the hover works. And if, it was, if I was using, if people use, theming my component had to override my declarations, I would need to notify every single one of them that actually I changed how the component works. And now you don't override the background. You override the box shadow. And they would have to repeat my box shadow. Now, their existing code works. Notes, no, notice how I themed the second button by just saying color blue. It still works even though I changed how the button component is implemented. So eighth takeaway, CSS variables enable theming independent of CSS structure, which I think is very important, especially if you're, you're using third-party components or your, developer, your, your JavaScript developer and your CSS developer are different people. Uh, also, one last thing. You might, be, you might, not, you might have noticed that I, I set the color to black here. This means that everybody theming my component has to override this uh, with their own color declaration, which is easy if my component is just a tag. But if it's like 
button dot my component uh, dot my framework whatever you know um, some weird selector like that they would need to have something with ha with at least the same specificity and it gets really messy so it's actually better if I provide a fallback like this but then I have to repeat the fallback three times which is kind of not dry it's very wet we enjoy typing, it stands for. So you might be thinking the whole point of variables is to reduce repetition. Now you're repeating this fallback like multiple times. One thing you can do is use variables for that as well. Let, you can define a different variable whose value is this. And then instead of using this um, color comma black everywhere, you can just use this internal variable. And when you release your component, you just tell people, you don't tell people about dash dash color. If they don't see your code, they don't know about it. If they see your code, well, they're on their own. And you just tell them, if you want to change the color of the component, use dash dash color. It's kind of like private variables, but by convention, instead of um, actual private variables, which is basically what JavaScript had for ages, so I guess it's fine. So the ninth takeaway is the, that default default values are possible. And yes, I totally made up this term, default default values, but I'm convinced it will catch on. So you can define another variable and set it to your, your public variable with a fallback. Another huge use for uh, CSS variables is responsive design. There's often a, a gutter variable, and then uh, people set margins and paddings related to that. Uh, and now you can have a media query that just changes this one variable and you don't have to change anything in the rest of your design. This is, of course, this is a very simple case of this. It's only using it in one place, but you can still see how when I resize the window, at some point I get the smaller gutter size. And of course, there are the, the common use cases that you use SAS variables for. Uh, these are kind of obvious, so I, I don't think they're particularly interesting. You can always use SAS for them um, uh, still. So it's, I think these are kind of implied. So the tenth takeaway is that CSS variables make responsive design easier. So be, after the common use cases, let's see some cool use cases. Um, Prefixed properties are one, uh, are one of them. Sure, uh, many people use auto prefixers or prefix free or something like that. Uh, but these days we're moving towards not having that many prefixed properties. So it's kind of overkill often to use a, an auto prefixer for like this one property. So CSS variables can help with that. Let's, um, so you can use the universal selector. Uh, use the trick I mentioned earlier about canceling inheritance, uh, which is setting the variable to initial. And then, you, you, you set both of the properties you want to replace with that variable. And now I can use that variable uh, everywhere, and it works exactly the same as the normal clip path property. So let's try doing a clip path here, uh, a polygon. Uh, let's hope this works, because writing a clip path on stage is kind of tricky. Uh, then 50% horizontal and 100% vertical. I'm trying to do a diamond, like a rhombus shape. Uh, and then zero horizontal and 50% vertical. Okay, that is it. that's it, it worked. And now I can apply it on any th of these divs I want. You can see it's not uh, inadvertently inherited. Um, I can apply the same clip path everywhere. Basically, it works exactly the same as the normal clip path. The only caveat is that you cannot animate it, which is a pretty big one, because clip, animated clip paths are pretty awesome. But if you don't need animation, that could be a solution. So CSS variables enable you to set multiple properties at once if you use this trick. Also, CSS variables enable you to set property shortcuts, kind of like um, mix-ins with only one property. So in this case, I, I wanted to have a purple shadow and only define the x, y, and uh, the x, y, and blur of uh, and blur offsets instead of having to define the color every time. So I use the same trick for canceling inheritance. You'll see it in all of these demos. Uh, 
and I, say, I set box shadow to whatever the value of purple shadow is, if it's defined, plus Rebecca purple, because I wanted the color to always be Rebecca purple. And then I can provide uh, only the extra uh, parts that are missing. Of, uh, of course, like, I could always do something like this instead. And here, specify box shadow with a var of this color. It's two ways to do the same thing. And which one's better depends on your specific use case and how big this part is. And it, you should use critical thinking and decide what's better for your specific use case. But it's interesting to keep in mind that CSS variables let you create single property mixins, like shortcuts to properties, what programmers would call function carrying in a way. Like it, it's kind of similar to function carrying, property carrying. Uh, CSS variables also let you create your own long hands. Like box shadow is a property that just has uh, that we, we only have box shadow. We don't have box shadow X, Y, blur, spread, all those separately. But we can hack it with CSS variables. So here I've defined all these property, all these variables. I've set box shadow to all these variables. All of them have fallbacks. Notice that in this one, the fallback is actually a white space character, um, except blur, which means I have to set bl at least blur. And then I can set all the other ones. So let's set it to 10 pixels, and then let's get box shadow color. Set it to blue, I don't know, something. Let's make this bigger, OK. Um, and then on, let's say, on hover, blech, blech, this. I think I've run into a small bug with my editor. Let's hope this works. Box shadow color uh, red. And it works. <laughs> so you can see how I was able to override the col only the color of the box shadow without having to override all the other parameters. So 13th takeaway, CSS variables enable you to create custom long hands. And also. You know how it's really annoying how every time, if, even if you just want to prepend a little te some, some text somewhere and nothing more, you, keep, you have to write an entire rule? Well, you don't have to. You can just set a, a prepend variable, and then you can set a before rule on the universal selector. This is implied. And the content is the, the value of the prepend variable, which means if the prepend variable is not set, you don't get anything, as you can see right now. But if you want, you can set prepend to some value, like let's say YOLO, and you get that text without having to write a whole new rule. Like you could have other CSS properties here. And of course, this also works from an inline style as well, if this is for the cases where this is useful. So CSS variables also enable you to kind of define your own properties in some cases, which I think is cool. So CSS variables aren't just useful for, uh, with HTML. They're also useful with SVG. Here is a pair of eyes. Uh, this is the SVG used to define them. It's OK if you don't understand it. The main thing to understand is that is, I've, I've assigned the class uh, of iris to the actual iris here. And I've applied some CSS to it. And, and I can change the CSS and have the eyes move. <laughs> However, this is, these are kind of arbitrary values. If I want the eyes to look all the way there, well, all the way here, it's 25 pixels. And if I want them to look all the, all the other way, all the way there, it's 75 pixels, which is kind of a weird value to remember. So instead, I can use a CSS variable, which goes from 0 to 1. And use calc here and say if it's from 25 pixels to 75. So plus 50 pixels multiplied by the value of the look variable. And now I can move the variable from 0 to 1, and it just works. So CSS variables plus SVG equals love. <laughs> 
CSS variables and JavaScript are also a very interesting combination. Uh, you can use the normal uh, methods that we already have to get and set CSS variables. Um, how many of you are, com are not comfortable with JavaScript, by the way? How many of you are comfortable with JavaScript? How many of you did not raise your hands in any of the two questions? <laughs> anyway, for those of you that are not comfortable with JavaScript, I promise that the code in this section is very short, and I will, I will explain it as I go. So uh, get property value lets you get um, the value of, the, of whatever CSS property you pass into it from the inline style. If, it's, if, you, if your property is not necessarily on the inline style, you can use uh, get computed style with the same function name. And to set a variable on the inline style, you can use set property. Why is it set property and get property value? I have no idea. I think it should be get property, but mm, who knows? Uh, and just with these few functions, we can do really cool things. For example, this is uh, setting one event listener to on the mouse move event. And every time I move the mouse, it's setting two CSS variables on the root element, on the HTML element, mouse x and mouse y. And their values are, are, go from 0 to 1. And they reflect how much I've moved my cursor relative to the viewport width and the viewport height. So let's see how I could use this. Uh, here I have a simple radial gradient in the center. And I can replace the static 50% with 100% multiplied by mouse x. And you can see that now it moves with my cursor horizontally. And I can even do this vertically. And now it moves with my cursor. And I can change my gradient. And I, I don't have to change my JavaScript. Because my, 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 my variables are generic enough that I can just transform them as I need in my CSS, which is excellent if the CSS developer and the JavaScript developer are different people. Because you don't have to go to the JavaScript developer and say, hey, I actually changed my mind. Could you like make a small change there? And they're like, bloody hell, you keep doing this. I'm so fed up with you, you designers. You keep changing, um, you keep changing your mind, and I can't do this anymore. No, no more of that. You just tell the developer to set some basic CSS variables, and you use them in your CSS as you see fit. And if they're generic enough, you can use them in multiple cases. Here I've used them for um, a gradient. Remember this? I can actually change this variable to mouse x. And now the eyes move with my mouse cursor. And it's exactly the same variable. I didn't have to, to, to write any new JavaScript code for this. Also. I can now use the values of inputs in my CSS. If I, just, you, if I just write a few lines of JavaScript that set a value variable on every input element. So here is a slider. It has a gradient on it. It's just an input type equals range that is a bit styled. And it has this gradient on it. And the gradient is static. But I can change it to be dynamic. So the values of the slider are 0 to 100. So I will multiply 1% with the value of the slider. And now you can see that as I move the slider, the gradient moves, which can be very useful for some styled sliders. And this doesn't look very nice, but I'm sure the designers among you can come up with a lot more interesting use cases. Also, I'm sure you've seen all these containers that scroll, and, you, and they do cool things as you scroll. They show progress bars and things like that. You can just have a scrolling class, go, go over all the elements with a scrolling class, add an, a scroll event, um, and then set a scroll variable that is, how much have you scrolled? And it goes from 0 to 1 again. And you can use it. Here I have a, a linear gradient. Nothing happens if I scroll right now. But I can change this 20% to calc. 100% multiplied by var scroll. I'm trying to go a bit fast um, because I've way run out of time. But I, I, I hope you guys are enjoying. Uh, so as you can see, now I, if I scroll, I get this background progress bar. And again, with the same variable, I can do a huge range of things. If I want to change. The, the background and make it uh, red and only at the top, I can do that. I can even go and say, actually, I want the background 
to be a color, an HSL color, whose hue changes from 0 to 360, not zero there, 50% lightness, depending on how much I've scrolled. Which is kind of crazy, but I mean, the sky's the limit. So the last takeaway is that CSS variables are a revolution for separation of style and behavior. CSS uh, developers and, and JavaScript developers can work in, the, in their preferred way and CSS variables basically define an API between the CSS code and the JavaScript code. So one of the arguments that React people often use for moving all the CSS code to JavaScript is that CSS is not flexible enough, and you cannot have CSS respond to like scroll events and resize events and um, input events and all sorts of things. Well, now you can. And you don't have to move your presentation to JavaScript to achieve it. You can just set CSS variables. So you can keep your style where it belongs, and you can keep your behavior where it belongs, and everyone's happy. So these are the URLs of the specs. Um, and one last slide about what's coming in the future. Mixins. And variables are not the future, by the way. This is variables are the present. Every browser supports them, except Edge, which is coming. Um, Mixins are the future, because they only have Chrome support right now. Um, you define mixins basically by a variable whose value is multiple de declarations. I can add a border here, for example. And then you call it with an at apply rule, which is useful for things that are static mixins. Sadly, it's not very useful for things that need variables, because if I use a variable here, for example, let's say color, and I set the variable here, to, let's say, orange, I, it, as you can see, nothing changes. The variables resolve based on the calling scope, which is here, which is kind of useless, because why would you declare your variables where you've, where you've declared your mix in? But still, it's, it's, it's something. For example, it would be useful for clear fix or all these mixins that don't really change. So that's about it. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed.